three more minutes so I, it feels a little loud is that okay I, the next speaker is about two feet taller than me so you may need to keep it this maybe a foot and a half but she's a very big prestigious woman so as are both of them um, I want to introduce myself my name is Lynn Snodgrass I'm the CEO of the Gresham Mary Chamber of Commerce the best darn chamber in the Pacific Northwest by far and we're growing and people are happy and new members are coming all the time. I want to thank all of you not only for your membership but also for taking the time to be here today. Whenever we leave to go someplace that's not work it costs us um, one way or the other so thank you for the expense that you are taking. I um, was trying to think of something funny to say this morning. I was going to rah-rah about the blazers and I was going to rah-rah that my husband did all the planting of the garden this weekend and I was going to rah-rah a bunch of rah-rahs and I didn't. Um, I can't. I did watch the blazer game last night. Did the rest of you watch the blazer game? Basketball's worthless until the last two minutes. I mean, there's no point in, if I could get a Blazer ticket for just two minutes and be the last two minutes, I would go downtown and, and watch the Blazer games. Um, but the rest of the time is like, who's in the audience? And oh, he spilled beer on him. And you know, I'm a people watcher at those kinds of games. Now football is serious sport. I mean, that is a serious sport. It's worth the time and the energy and the drive not to Eugene to watch the Ducks, but it's worth the drive. Is this recorded so that everybody will see this forever in prosperity? I want to thank our presenting sponsors. Robin Dodge Little, thank you so much, Columbia Bank, for sponsoring the event today. And Portland General Electric is also a sponsor. Uh, Dean Funk is on his way. I also want to thank our stakeholder sponsor, who happens to be a speaker today, and that's Gresham Barlow School District. So thank you, Dr. Pereira, for your sponsorship. And Metro East Community Media. Keith, you're doing another great job. And be sure, if you enjoyed the, the um, <coughs> recording today, the taping and the conversation we had today, there's replays re, um, that happen that we have these on the registration table as you go out. So grab one and listen to it again because you might have missed something. Today's going to be jam-packed. I would also like to recognize some of our elected officials. Do we have any school board members in the audience that I don't know of any school board members? Any wannabe school board members? OK, well, so, so much for that. <clears throat> I would like to recognize, though, our um, board members. And one of our board members is also a counselor from Gresham. And Councillor Carolyn Eccles is also a chamber board member. Carolyn, thank you for being here today. And Mike Schofield, who has pockets full of cash, he's on our board. He's the CFO of the Gresham, Mary Cham uh, Gresham Barlow School District, and he's on our board. <laughs> Steve Brown, who buys barrels of ink, is here with us. He's from Pamplin and Outlook. Steve, thank you for your service as a board member. And in a minute, I'm going to bring Warner Allen up to um, the podium. He is the chair of the Government Affairs Council and is also on our board. But while, while um, Angela is in the room, she's whispering to somebody about what's in the food. So it's, this is like work. She doesn't pay attention when I'm speaking, ever. <laughs> and is Holly here too? Could you? Where's Holly? There's Holly. OK, Angela just celebrated her third year with the Gresham Chamber of Commerce. Can you thank her for that? We're, just, we're so grateful. So grateful that she walked in and said, I think I want to work here. And I had to convince her that it was actually the right place for her to be. And she's done an amazing job. And Holly hasn't been with this quite a year, but she's already having a celebration. She had a birthday last two weeks ago and we're going to celebrate her birthday this month this week so thank you both 
So that just leaves Shelly and I, we, you know, nobody, no celebrations, no anything. So there we go. So the topic today is timely, as you know. The topic today is state of education, and I personally, um, I've shared this with you in the past, have a vested interest in what happens in our school system because I have seven wonderful grandchildren, ages from seven to 17. They all will, hopefully, keep our fingers crossed, graduate, and they'll graduate from Barlow High School if they stay where they are right now. So what goes on in the classroom financially and educationally is very important to me as a grandparent. My daughter's also graduated from Barlow High School, so I've been here a long time and I've watched what's happened for a long time, so I personally have a vested interest. But even if you don't have children in the school district, you have a vested interest in what's going on, and you know that to be true. So today, we're going to start with the state of education. With that, I'd like to invite Warner Allen up to introduce our speakers. Warner? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so we have two speakers here of the three local superintendents, two of them are with us. Um, and they will be featured in our upcoming uh, Chamber magazine. The article is called Huge Impact Despite Speed Bumps. Um, so we urge you to read the article when you receive your directory in June, yeah, and I think you will appreciate the personal background information that's in that article. So I'm going to introduce our speakers sort of sequentially rather than all one. So our first speaker is Superintendent Dr. Catrice Pereira. Uh, Dr. Catrice Pereira is the superintendent of the Gresham Barlow School District and has been so since July 1 of 2017. She was the recipient of the National Association of School Superintendents 2015 Superintendent of the Year. Dr. Pereira is a self-proclaimed lifelong learner. She is widely recognized as an innovator and a visionary leader for a progressively global learning environment for all grade levels. She is the former Urban Markets Division National Director for McGraw-Hill Education. And prior to that, she served as the superintendent in the Isle of Wright County Schools in Smithfield, Virginia from 2011 to 2015. We don't have enough time to tell you all of the opportunities she took advantage of to change the trajectory of the school district she has worked for, but have comfort that she knows what she's doing and she can get it done. Dr. Brown, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Warner, for that uh, kind welcome. Actually, yeah, kind of reflected on some things there. So thank you all for having me here today. Um, it's going to be hard for me to stand behind the podium because I'm a classroom teacher at heart and I like to move around uh, when I'm facilitating some information with students. But I'll stay uh, pegged here because I know everything's being recorded. Again, my name is Catrice Pereira and I'm happy to be here today. Um, we, when, when Warner was mentioning those things, Warner, I want you to know I've accomplished none of that on my own. All that was with teamwork. Um, and for me, I'm a strong believer in teamwork, uh, having you know, many years participated in organized sports, got big hands, you can guess what I played, women's basketball. I'm probably the only female you might know that could palm the ball, <laughs> both hands at the same time. <clears throat> I, I thought I would bring those, but Lynn said, yeah, no, no, you know, no props. Uh, but today I want to talk to you a little bit about our, our district and give you a little bit of an update of what we've been doing, or at least myself, for the last two years, if you will. Um, and I, I want to talk to you a little bit about my listening and learning tour. Um, I did bring some team members with me today to help talk a little bit about the instructional piece, and that's our assistant superintendent, Lisa Riggs, um, who is actually a native of the Pacific Northwest. I stole her from Texas. <laughs> and then I think you all know Money Mike over here, and Mike, I hope none of that money is in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if it has GBDS, GBSD on it, um, <clears throat> or associated with it. And I also have Athena, who is more than just a clicker today. She is our communications person. So a little bit about listening and learning. Last year, as you know, um, <clears throat> I spent the entire year just about 
listening and learning to the community and understanding and trying to learn about what our district wants. Um, and it was very loud and clear to me from the students I met in our elementary schools to some of our most senior uh, community members in this district uh, about what they wanted. And they did not once ever talk to me about assessment scores or testing. I don't recall that at all. Most of it was about what they wanted to see in our students. Um, and Lisa's going to deliver a little bit of that about the instructional piece and aligning those things. But one of the things I think we all have to start getting comfortable with, I think we've made a mistake in the last 15 years. Educators ourselves, we've known that we should not have gone down this whole standards-based only testing one day and saying that's how you are. I mean, think about what you do on a daily basis. If you take one day, 45 minutes out of that day for an assessment, and then that's, that's how you are labeled or pegged or identified. They, we're doing that to kids, and we're doing that to schools, and we're doing that to school districts. And so as a community, we have to decide whether we want to prepare our kids to take math tests or, and understand those simple content, or to think like a mathematician. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather have a student be exposed to that and be able to think like a mathematician. Or learn science facts, or be able to think like a scientist. And that's what you hopefully you will see in the information that we'll share with you today. That's what we are planning to do. And so with that in mind, um, we took that information to our board um, after some audits as well of our curriculum. Um, and we worked with the board to drum up a new mission. Right? Because the old mission wasn't going to work, because most of that was about testing, et cetera. And so that was about inspiring and empowering. And again, each student is purposely used because we have to personalize things for our students. We have to meet them where they are. We have to give them what they need in order to learn. Think about at the table. Everybody's plate was a different size, how much food you had on it. But that food was for you. We had one meal. Everybody had different shares. Same thing with instruction. <clears throat> New vision. Um, is to ensure that our students, as you know, we're organs changing and diversifying. We want to make sure that our students are also prepared to, to meet those responsibilities in the, in the future, uh, that, that they are culturally responsive graduates um, in an ever-changing global community. It's not just about Gresham. This is bigger than Gresham. This is about Oregon. This is about the United States. This is about the world. And our students will have that access. Um, we try to base all of our decisions based on these three things. Community first. Stewardship as well along the way, especially with our taxpayer dollars. Uh, can't, get, can't get into a scenario where we have taxpayer fatigue. Um, and also integrity, being transparent and, and trustworthy with those things. So with that, we had three goals. One is to provide effective, high-quality instruction for each student. Not saying that that's not happening, but what's not happening is not consistent across the district. And so in order for us to better do that and deliver that mission and vision, we have to ensure that those things are happening. Uh, second one was about ensuring that we create physically and emotionally safe uh, classrooms. As you all may have heard, that, you know, the whole media is doing a whole big series on the crisis in the classroom. Well, it, it's, it's, it's crises that begin outside the classroom. Unfortunately, schools reflect the communities we serve. And those things are happening outside. Um, but we, we, ha we can do some things as well within the classroom. Not trying to give my teachers more than they can handle or give, put one more thing on their plate. But making sure that we have the appropriate curriculum um, exposure and opportunities for our students. And the last one, not least, but these are not in ranking order, is again being prudent with our resources that we have. Uh, we've done, uh, we've used a, what we call a logic model, and Lisa could talk to you about that as well, where we do the, the input, output, outcome. And if we're investing in things, we need to see that on the other end. In business, you call that a return on investment. In my world, we call it a return on instruction, right? <clears throat> And so we did that by beginning with that portrait of a graduate. What do you want to see in our, in our students? As, as um, we only had 4,000 uh, submittals, <laughs> 4,000. That's all the characteristics that everybody in the community wanted to see in our students. That's a daunting task. <laughs> but we're getting prepared for it. And these are just, this is just a word or a representative of that. But I want to bring Lisa up to talk to you a little bit about that portrait, um, and I think uh, we're dividing up this 25 minutes, so if it sounds like I'm kind of speeding, if you will, I am because I want to make sure Lisa and Mike have some time. But that portrait of a graduate is going to be very important. It's going to guide a lot of our work along with our mission, vision, and goals. And so with that, Lisa, if you will come and talk just a little bit about a uh, portrait of a graduate, and then we'll have Mike up for I know all of you are waiting to know about money. 
the budget. Come on. Thank you. Um, I'm excited to say that I got a little bit of listening and learning as well in my first year here and it was um, it's great to be back in the Northwest and it was great to get to know our community. The way I did that is working on the portrait of a graduate. To start with a new mission and vision of our board we also needed to start with our outcome. What do our community members and what do our families and what do our students want to be able to achieve once they graduate? Who do they want to be? That's really what the portrait of a graduate will tell us. We. Um, are in our final stages, but what you saw were those powerful skills, not soft skills, the powerful skills, power skills, that we do need to be content con uh, literate. We need to be content ready, but we need more than that. We need to make sure that we are ready for a living wage job and that we are committed to those um, standards in our classrooms to be prepared for the future. That was what was so exciting about our portrait of a graduate. What's not so exciting is that we've taken it back and revisioned it a few times and so we want to get it just perfect before our, we launch our image but we're excited for that. So this was an example but we wanted to make sure and this is what we learned that um, we wanted to look like Gresham, this, this didn't, and we wanted to look like our, our students, which is very diverse, and this didn't, so we took it back to the drawing board. We're excited to launch that soon. Um, through that, um, oh, okay, through that we, we really worked on uh, the four areas in which we uh, want to uh, work on and invest in our, in our students. And one of those is our pathway. Our college and career pathways that align with the Oregon um, state pathways because that's really what the community needs our uh, graduates to become. And those are um, health sciences, industry and engineering human uh, resources and public services, natural resources, business management, and arts, information, technology, and communication. What we're doing is slowly rolling these out, and we've already uh, started the pathway for, um, as you might guess, um, industry and engineering, because we are in the middle of our bond. And so some examples are that we've partnered with our great um, leaders in our builders, and they're building with elementary, middle, and high school students. We're um, provided internships, and we're getting our students prepared for that type of workforce. It's exciting to see. It's something that we've um, looked at across the state. We went to Hillsboro and we brought the community, um, we brought uh, some folks from the city, we brought folks from uh, the chamber, and we really want to just say that this is a partnership for the entire community. We are looking for someone to be able to coordinate with business and chamber and others to really facilitate this work, but our executive director of partnerships and all of our team are doing that as well. Um, anything else that you yeah, are thinking? Yeah, we, you should have Yes. These are what we're about to roll out. And what I will say is we, we have a good start. What you need to realize is that careers don't just start in high school. You don't just give that experience. It's really from cradle to career. And so we are giving touch points with all of our elementary students. And they're able to um, really tap into any one of these pathways. And then in middle school, we have stream labs, which are science, technology, reading, because we need literate students, um, engineering, arts, and math. And we're excited to see that as we then head into those real life experiences every day um, in turn interning with our students. So with, with those um, priorities, if you will, in, in instruction, we try to focus on looking at what we're going to invest in this year. And what I'll say to you, money is not necessarily always the problem for us in education. Um, we do a lot of things, um, but I also think we can also do those a lot better as well. And so that logic model as I was sharing earlier and assessing everything that we have, uh, we're trying to make sure that those things are happening. So we talk about the four investments, improvements, and again, those are layers of continuum of evidence-based uh, information that will allow us to ensure that we're utilizing our dollars to the maximum. And I'm not gonna insult your intelligence by reading all these things to you, but truly know that there's data and evidence that will be collected along the way to ensure that we are doing those things. Um, and we've 
given some examples here on the, those type of layers of evidence uh, that will be some indicators for our success and for our progress. Um, of course, everything's rooted in databases. Uh, otherwise, we're shooting in the dark, right? <laughs> if you don't have data to support it, um, what was the famous uh, quote that, you know, trust but verify? This is how we verify right here is through our data to ensure that we're hitting those targets. Um, also, again, ensuring our learning environment and thanks to the community, we are definitely, you know, making sure we're get, making good use of the, that $300 million uh, bond that we have. Our schools are looking great. I can't wait for you all to see them. Mike's going to talk to you a little bit about some schedules. If you, if you know how much that, there's a lot of research that says that that connects to student achievement as well. And so I'm excited about that, um, that consequence of it, if you will, or the benefits. Um, and again, including family and community. These are some key indicators, again, from the state. This is not our only indicator of success, though. Again, we have to decide, do we want our students to just learn math facts and concepts or, t or think like one? I think like a mathematician. And so we're at this phase um, in our strategic planning where we're looking at how we're going to, you know, prioritize those things and pay for those uh, with, through our, our budgeting. And with that, Money Mike, who does not have the money in his pocket. <laughs> I promise. Patrice, appreciate it. So, Catrice asked me to come speak with you today because you've heard a little bit about the mission and vision. Uh, uh, you heard Lisa talk about investments uh, that we want to make. Some of those are, are monetary and others are not. I want to give you a little orientation as to where we are as a district uh, right now. And, and, and I've given you some numbers here. I can't read them, so I bet you can't either. Uh, so I'll describe it a little bit for you. But we go all the way back to 2016-17 in terms of where we were as a district, and we ended that year with just under $12 million uh, of ending fund balance and resource. As we go across and we look to where we're going to finish the 18-19 school year, we'll be well over $15 million. So generally speaking, the key takeaway there is we have been building our fund balance over a number of years. Uh, in addition to that, uh, two years ago, the board wisely set up a PERS reserve so that we could begin to bank some dollars for future costs of PERS and future increases. Uh, that is all the buzz and a lot of talk about PERS recently. Uh, in terms of what it means to local governments like ours. So we have been building that. Uh, we are at a new biennium, so the 1921 biennium is here. Uh, we have based our budget based on the governor's uh, original recommended balanced budget, which is $8.97 billion for K-12 education. That's what we've used uh, to, to prepare our budget. It was approved last week by the Budget Committee. It'll go to the board in a couple of weeks. Uh, so we're looking forward to uh, um, getting that moved on. None of our budget in the coming year anticipates the Student Success Act or any resources from it. We know it passed. We know the governor signed the legislation uh, this, I think, mon was it Monday? Yes. On Monday? Okay, yeah yesterday. Um, so uh, none of those funds will be anticipated in the first year of this biennium and we'll have a whole process uh, in terms of what we need to do as a school district to determine how those how those funds will be used. Uh, rule writing essentially if you want the big picture moving forward there will be some rule and regulation writing around this um, investment. Uh, school districts like ours will have to uh, meet with the community meet with the board, provide a plan to the board. We'll do that kind of in the uh, fall and winter of this next year. We'll have to submit some sort of an application to ODE in the spring, and we'll probably get some uh, indication as to uh, whether our plan's approved and, and whether we've met the criteria next spring. So uh, this will not be something that we will um, include in our budget for this coming school year. Uh, I will tell you too, just from a big picture standpoint, uh, our investments that we have will be modest. Um, we, we don't have significant investment going on. Um, we're kind of maintaining and treading water at the moment. Uh, and, and that's been fairly intentional, again, knowing uh, where our cost drivers are coming in the future. Uh, the Student Success Act will allow us to make some additional investments in things like the big buckets. The big buckets were things like lowering class size, extending the school year. Uh, that's about half the money. Another 30% of the money would be designated for things like statewide initiatives uh, that are more targeted and, and dealing with things like equity and how we, how we give kids an equitable opportunity in our schools. And finally, the remaining percentage is really, it's up to 20%, and that's for kind of the pre-K area. That's a focus at the state level. Um, so that's kind of how those statewide initiatives would play in. And those will play in, again, um, stay tuned, because we'll spend this next fall and winter kind of 
talking about the plan, what it ought to look like, and getting it set up. I will tell you that the one thing that you should take away from this is when I put these together, I have this resource and I have these expenditures. And the second column here is benefits. And I can, I can describe this number in 16, 17. It was $30 million. Projecting out not to the next year, but 2020, 2021, that benefit light item will be $40 million. That's a $10 million increase in five years. Uh, the primary driver of that is our public pension system, and it is driving our cost structure. And it is, uh, it's difficult for folks, uh, like when I go talk to folks, especially in the business community, I tell them, well, I got a 10% increase this biennium. So over two years, I'm getting a 10% 10 10 increase. And folks think, you should be able to make some significant investment with those dollars, right? Well, it turns out I can't because I'm paying my bill, right? I've got this pension obligation that I'm dealing with. So it's very difficult and can be a little bit frustrating for folks to understand that, but that's primarily what we're doing. We've kind of maintained, we've lowered class sizes in our elementaries a little bit over the last few years, but we haven't done anything significant um, to be, uh, from a dollar perspective to make those improvements. So that's kind of the budget piece uh, in a glance. Uh, the school bond, I, I'll turn on my, my second shift. Uh, my day job CFO, my night job t turns out to be school bond work. Uh, you have a handout on the other side of the pathways one that kind of describes the projects and where we're at. I know many of you see the four big projects going on, North and East Gresham Elementary Schools. Those are replacement schools. Both will open in September, uh, ready to go. Shiny and new. Uh, Gresham High School, I, that's the one I get the most comments about. Uh, the the three-story classroom tower, that's the tall piece, that is up. That's 53 new classrooms that will be ready in uh, September as well. The auditorium and black box theater, those areas will have the shell of those done in September. The ac actually occupying the spaces won't happen until after uh, winter break. Um, but the shell will be in place and we'll keep working on the interior spaces there. Uh, the Gresham High will start phase two. Phase two will be going into the building where it is, they'll get the new gymnasium um, and the rest of the spaces and we'll connect it to the uh, existing cafeteria and uh, so, so that phase will be done in, in the fall of 2021. Similar things going on at Barlow High School, although it is a multi-phased approach. If you, you kind of look at Gresham High and you can see that whole building going up in a very small area, you go out to Barlow, you gotta walk two miles to see all the improvement because it's much more spread out. Um, but we're excited about the work going on there as well. Uh, the stadium out there looks fantastic. Coming around and be ready for uh, uh, athletics and activities in the fall. Uh, in addition to that, we have a number of uh, significant safety and security improvements. We're doing vestibules in all our schools. Uh, next week, or, or by the end of this month, we will finish up the classroom uh, door locks and hardware project, which was a priority for our teachers. Uh, for those of you that don't know, we had doors that you could not lock internally. You had to go out into the hallway to be able to lock your door. That project will be complete uh, again in a couple of weeks. Uh, we have school furniture, a ton of school furniture that's been replaced for the classrooms, which is uh, great. A lot of technology, and um, again, I have a list here. You can visit the website, GreshamBarlowBond.org, if you want to kind of see what's going on. I think you're suggest. Or, am I beyond it? Okay. Were you moving along? Oh, thank you so much. All right. I, th I think that's the end of mine. Thank you. <laughs> So we're here to get, obviously, a state of the schools, and it would not be right if I did not end uh, with some things that uh, really highlight um, the excitement around this whole bond project and pieces, of things that it drives in the community. Other than uh, our workers usually on a normal basis are downtown for lunch, they're spending money and dollars are being reinvested right here in this community, which is an outstanding thing, I think. Um, but the best part is to watch our students. And so as we have been doing these uh, groundbreaking ceremonies, the principals usually select some students to come out and, and take part in them and participate in it. But almost every time I can look in any direction of that school and find other kids who are not necessarily there with us, but are there with us because they're peering through windows, peering through their fence, et cetera. And so for me, it's kind of exciting to, um, to think about all the inspiration that we're creating over time for our students. These are some students at uh, East Gresham, I believe. This is recess. Look what they're doing. Is that not the cutest thing? 
That is the cutest, it's sweet. And so again, I wonder how many architects, how many designers, how many construction workers, project managers, et cetera, you name it, are we inspiring with this opportunity? Which is why I can share with you that our first pathway we launch is the one to dealing with construction. And here's another one. <clears throat> this is at Hall. We're breaking ground, ceremonies taking place. These students are in the library. Look what they're doing. They're not finding books. They're look, taking looks, not finding books um, at what's going on out on the, in, behind their school because they're getting an extension uh, to their school. And this was so adorable that I had to go in and thank them. And they just about maul myself and um, um, Mayor Bemis because he was there too. Uh, both of us almost fell over because the kids just bum rushed us, if you will. Um, this is just a, a look inside of, um, I think it's East Gresham's uh, cafetorium kind of thing, where there's an auditorium and a cafeteria to kind of together, uh, which will be an outstanding piece for them as well. And of course, always kids. Um, that's, that, this is what this is all about, and that's why I will end with this last slide, because it's about our kids, it's about our future, that the investment that we make in our students today will impact this community in the long run. It's good for our locality, it's good for our state, and ultimately it's good for our country. Um, and so on behalf of our uh, board of directors and every single student and teacher and staff member in our um, school district, I wanna say thank you to the community for allowing us this awesome opportunity to bring forth um, what we feel to be, will be, uh, continued quality education for our students in the 21st century. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pereira. Um, next up is uh, Superintendent Dr. Dana Diaz. Um, Dr. Diaz is the superintendent of the Rental School District, has been since July 1, 2018. She's coming up on her first anniversary with the school district. Dr. Diaz was chosen as the new superintendent after an exhaustive nationwide search. She holds a doctorate in philosophy in education administration from the University of Texas at Austin, a master's degree in preschool education from the University of Houston Clear Lake, and a bachelor's degree from the University of uh, Mary Hardin Baylor. Prior to joining the Reynolds School District, she was the superintendent of schools for the San Juan Island School District in Friday Harbor, Washington. Before working with San Juan Island School District, she was assistant superintendent at El Paso Independent School District, 20,000 students, regional superintendent of the School District of Philadelphia, 130,000 um, students, Director of Student Engagement at Fort Worth Independent School District, 80,000 students, Statewide Technical Assistance Provider at the Dallas Independent School District, 157,000 students, and the Richard Milburn Academy and Governor's Initiative Education Specialist in Region 13, Education School District, 386,700 students in Austin, Texas. Now that's a lot of students whose lives were touched by Dr. Diaz. She also was elementary principal in Round Rock, Texas, district bilingual coordinator in LaPorte, Texas, and a bilingual education elementary teacher in Houston, Texas, and Pasadena, Texas. Please welcome Dr. Diaz. I have some hard uh, shoes to fill since our, my colleague Catrice Perra just did a phenomenal job with her team. I hope I can beat that presentation. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to come and uh, consult with you about the work of service with our young people and our staff and uh, families at Reynolds School District. Uh, everyone has a copy of a flyer that is in your pack in your table. And what I want you to know is that the school board has really directed me to ensure that the mission is alive in every single classroom, that we actually act actualize the vision of the district, which is each and every child prepared for a world yet to be imagined, 
that we also demonstrate our values. And they gave me uh, two goals to focus on this academic year, student achievement and equity. And one of the things I did as soon as I was hired July the 1st is when I met with all of the administrators, the team and I, we kind of consulted about what are we going to do to ensure that we're focused on student achievement and equity. So every single department in the district and every single school in the district has a school improvement plan and a department improvement plan that is focused on student achievement and equity. And I am proud to tell you today that we actually met our achievement goals mid-year in March, and I want to applaud all of the teachers and students in our schools for doing that. We achieved our achievement goals. We're still working on some of our equity goals, but I'm really proud when I did my mid-year evaluation and uh, my team presented the results, the achievement results, we were able to meet our goals in literacy and in numeracy, and especially with our uh, kindergarten students ready uh, to, to learn and ready for reading when they attend first grade. Um, so we do have our four goals, student achievement, equity, re fiscal responsibility, and um, communication and so I do have my team member here from the communication department Stephanie and Beth and so if, um, thank you so much for being here and supporting me but one of the things I want to tell you about transformational leadership is that it's not just about um, being the leader and the servant leader but there's a couple of um, key indicators that a, a transformational leader needs to have and I want to share that with you number one the transformational leader needs to focus on excellence we believe that every child deserves a future of limitless possibilities. To get there, we need transformative leaders to open the doors of opportunity so every school, every classroom, and every student gets what they need to be successful. A transformational leader also needs to believe in equity. Equity, equity is essential to ensure the needs of every student are met. It is therefore integrated in all aspects of the program and leadership to help every child reach their full potential. That includes acknowledging the history behind the systems and structures that drive inequities and how they manifest in education today and actively work to dismantle them. I have to challenge powerful stakeholders to ensure that the students and communities who, the most, who need it the most get the resources they need to succeed and thrive. And I have to also commit to equity-focused decision-making throughout the school system and community served. Another framework is vision, creating and communicating a strong, clear image of success that guides the organization's goals and objectives. Also be an inspirational leader. Explain complex information in an accessible manner, balancing the use of information and emotion to reach a range of audiences. We have to have strategy. Advance the organization by developing and exec executing a system level strategy that translates vision into short term and long term plans aligned with organizational goals and objectives. We also have to have talent development. We build an environment to attract, retain, and develop exceptional talent throughout the organization. We also have to navigate. We recognize the assets that exist in the communities we serve that seek and authentically understand their needs. And we have also have to have sustainable impact. We embed impactful change in the organization, culture, strategy, and practices. So my presentation today is actually about impact. So I serve 10,800 students. We serve 10,800 students. We have 16 schools. We have 1,200 plus staff members. We have one common vision. Each and every child will be prepared for a yet world to be imagined. And we have five cities, municipalities that we serve. We serve Wood, um, Wood Village, Fairview, Troutdale, Gresham, and East Portland. And the students that we serve, we have 41% Hispanic students, 33% um, white. 9% black, 8% Asian, 8% Pacific Islander, and 1% multiracial. We speak eight, 61 spoken languages. As a matter of fact, our student population come from 126 countries. Uh, we have 46% of our students are English learners. Um, students that receive special ed services are 16%. Uh, our students experiencing poverty is 72%, and our students experiencing homelessness is 10%. So just think about one in every 10 student ex ex experience homelessness in our, in our district. And now we don't call it homeless, we call it houseless. It's a new, it's a new PC word that we use. 
And of course, we have our comprehensive high school and alternative high school. We have 11 elementary, we have our middle schools, and then we also have three charter schools, MLA and uh, Rockwood Prepwood Academy and um, Arthur Academy as well. And then, of course, um, I have the L to the third power, listen, learn, and lead. During my first 90 days, um, I was finding out what is it that is working well in our district and what are the things that need to improve. And so I work with great people, committed people, smart people, talented people that are loyal to the organization. And that is the blessing that I have. Um, and they're funny. They love to you know, have fun while they're doing the work. And, and we're serious when we have to be serious. Um, I also have a very diverse student population. And and I have strong community partners, and each and every one of you in the room represents the community partners that we have. But then we also have opportunities for improvement. Um, our system um, needs improvement. We lack um, collaboration. We work in silos. Um, we may live in the same house, but you stay in your room and I stay in my room and let's not talk to one another. So now we're trying to collaborate and create a, a cohort of people that actually know what we're doing. The left hand should know what the right hand is doing. So we're actually working out on, on increasing our cross-functional teams. Uh, we also are making, sh making sure that our financial resources are aligned with our student outcomes. So in a few minutes, I'm going to show you how we addressed the four items that came as opportunities for improvement. Also, real relationships, I call, I call it R square, R to the second power, um, having some real relationships and ensuring that we have customer service, and then of course, family and community engagement. So the first thing that came up from all of the department supervisors and all of the principals was that there was a bottleneck with the hiring process between HR and finance. And our principals were like, Dana, we really need to hire the people when the budget is approved by the board. So what did we do? We created a new hiring process with cross-functional teams. And we, we shared it with our RTT. Our RTT is our Reynolds transformational team, all of the principals and department supervisors. We now have a flow chart. We've actually um, reduced the number of approvals that we have to have for approving um, uh, staff and employees. And right now, as of today, I haven't heard any negative about the improvement that we made in this area. Everyone is excited that they're able to hire their staff in a facilitated manner, in a very quick manner. But this started back in um, September, October, and we finalized it in our December RTT meeting. And we're proud to say that it's been improved, and we're working on making sure that it gets better for the 1920 school year. We even streamlined our budgeting process. It is my understanding, according to my team, that it is the first time that our budget committee had approved our proposed budget with a unanimous vote at our second meeting. Um, not only that, but we finished our meeting at 7.30 p.m. Um, I remember one of my board members um, saying that one of our agreements is to finish before 10 p.m. and we accomplished that at our two budget meetings where we finished at a reasonable time. And what we started back in November, we met with all of our community partners to let us know what is it that they would like for us to budget. Um, our board actually approved uh, budget priorities in December. December, um, all of our principals submitted all of their budget requests and all, all of the expenditures by March, and we were able to have our budget meetings uh, finally approving our proposed budget May the 9th, and now our board will approve the budget on June the 12th during our business meeting. So we streamlined the process very smooth. And my, one of my team says, so Dana, what did you think about the budget process? I think it was pretty good. And they go, Dana, it was better than good. I go, but this is my baseline. So that means it has to be better next year, right? So this is um, what we did, and we, we're already planning 1920 school year, and we're establishing the dates to make sure that we have a really good Gantt chart for the 1920 school year. And then what I did is we're really focusing on customer service, and we're partnering with the Ritz-Carlton Leadership Center because our students and our teachers and our staff deserve world-class service. And let me say that again. Our students, families, teachers, and staff deserve world-class service. And so um, this June, all of our principals and secretaries um, are going to be trained by the project director of the Ritz-Carlton Leadership Center. All of the transportation and nutrition will be trained in August. 
Um, and then we will also be trained on the art of the apology in August. The three-year professional development plan will continue in June of 2020. We will create our service excellence culture, where we will create some standards. Then we will also continue with the memorable customer service, um, and then we will continue to finalize our gold standards. And then, of course, the Re Leadership Center will come and visit us to make sure that we're implementing a world-class customer service process in our district for our young people and their families. One of the things our families have told us over and over again is how important it is to have people that speak their language at our schools. And so we have to be very intentional to make sure that we have staff in our schools. And so recently, just last week, at Raider Rumble, I met a junior at the high school who speaks, I can't even remember, I would have to check my email, but he speaks a language where we, don't, we do not have an interpreter. I connected him with my HR person, and uh, my HR person connected him with our EL person who does the interpreter. And so he's gonna be trained, uh, and once he gets trained, he will be hired as an interpreter in our district because the student speaks about three to four languages. And he's gonna graduate next year, and he's looking for a job for when he graduates. So guess what? We're probably gonna be able to have one of our students to be one of our interpreters in our district. So we're very excited about that. And then we'll be able to provide really good customer service to our families based on making sure that we have um, families and we have staff that can speak to our families in our schools. And then we'll do some culturally responsive pilots. One of the things we've learned and that I've been able to do in our system because we um, need to improve on uh, increasing cross-functional teams. A lot of my cabinet members and their direct reports were trained by the American Society for Quality. Many of them will be Yellow, yellow Belt certified in, um, in July. I believe it's July, yeah. And, um, and what, what we learned is that whenever we're gonna implement something new in a system as large as ours, we have to have a pilot. And so one of the things we're doing is we're piloting a few new initiatives in our school district that are culturally responsive. We're piloting academic parent-teacher teams. It is a research-based family engagement where, that is very high impact, which includes families and teachers working together on student achievement, and that will be at Fairview Elementary School. We're also piloting Children's Defense Fund Freedom Schools as a culturally responsive summer literacy program, um, and we're gonna pilot that at HB Lee Middle School that also has a family and community uh, engagement impact. They are going to need some volunteer readers. They have a Harambe for about 30 days, and during the Harambe, they have story time where a community member will come and read to the students. So if you want to volunteer, don't forget to call Danelle uh, Heitler. She is the principal at H.B. Lee Middle School. And then we are also, one of the things that happened during my listening and learning sessions, a lot of my families that applied for interdistrict transfer, um, the reason they wanted to leave is because they didn't have daycare for their children. A lot of the families were single parent uh, homes, and so what we decided is to have before care and after care. And we were the only district in the region, in the East County, that didn't have before care and after care. So we visited sites at Gresham Barlow and at David Douglas, and so we're gonna pilot this summer, and we're gonna offer before care and after care in five of the elementary school with the hope of having um, all of our elementary schools providing before care and after care here uh, for 2021. And of course, transformational processes continued. We have to define, we have to understand the current challenges of the district. We have to assess, we have to, I have to meet with my key cabinet members regularly. Uh, we have to make sure that we um, look at our competencies and we continue to do professional development. We have to recommend, recommend our organizational structure. So as I speak to you today, I'm reorganizing my central office. Um, I used to have an assistant superintendent for teaching and learning. Uh, he is going to go speak uh, uh, work for Stanford Children. I am retitling that position to Chief Academic Officer, and I'll be posting that position in about two weeks. So if you know of anyone that has a graduate degree or a PhD or EDD that is interested in being a Chief Academic Officer, we will have a vacancy at Reynolds School District. I also have my finance, Director of Finance, who's gonna be directly reporting to me, and my Deputy CEO will be the Chief Operations Officer. So those are the transformational things that I'm doing in Central Office office now. Um, phase one of communication just went out last Friday. We're going to be doing some more transformation. I just learned that another team member
member has received another position, so I'm going to change that title of that position, and I'm going to restructure the organization. Um, and so one of the things that I always do is I make the recommendation, and then I develop. I continue to provide coaching for the team, or if not, I ask my team to coach me. Stephanie right now is making sure that she's going to coach me during my communication process today. Um, and then, of course, build, making sure that we have our retreat. Our cabinet and I, we just had a, a retreat yesterday on equity, and we're going to continue to learn, establish norms, and build organizational capacity to make sure that we sustain the leadership in, within our system to make sure that we're also providing service to our principals, our teachers, our students, and our families. So how do you anchor change to make long impact? The, the most important thing is communication. Um, making sure that I communicate with my cabinet, with my central office, my principals, my staff, and then of course students and families. Uh, also always identifying areas uh, to continuously improve, making sure that I create cross-functional teams, share the information regularly, and making sure that we learn from our lessons. Um, and so that's very important. One of the things I've always learned is that in, in life, when you work with human beings, you have human problems, and so how do you solve the problems within the human beings that you're working with? with. And then, of course, creating a sense of urgency um, and making sure that the stakeholders actually see the action and results from the listening and learning sessions. And um, with organizational transformation, you will see increased student achievement. And our motto is, we are Reynolds. Uh, so every time I, I post on Twitter, at the end of my posting, I always say, we are, t we are Reynolds. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to present to you today. One of the things I want to do is I want to plug something. Are you ready? You have a pencil? Please write down this date and time for any of you that are available on May the 30th. Six o'clock, the Reynolds Education Foundation is having their fundraiser at Edgefield, and we would love for you to attend because we are raising money for students and teachers and it's always going back to the classroom. So if you're available, please come and play with us because we like to have fun and we like to work hard. Thank you so much. May 30th. So Dr. Diaz, why don't you stay up there? <clears throat> Dr. Pereira, why don't you go on up on um, the podium as well? So we're turning it over to you to ask questions. Take a <clears throat> selfie. Robin, here you go. <laughs> I've been working, um, I'm Robin Dodge Little with Columbia Bank. I've been working pretty closely with a lot of manufacturers and um, I'm finding as I'm working with them that they are very stressed with trying to find qualified workers. Um, can you maybe address how you're uh, working towards helping that workflow. Not everybody's going to college, so thanks. So one of the things that Dr. Carrera's team mentioned are the career and uh, pathways, and we have that at our high school as well. So I believe that what's important for your um, colleagues is to come and visit our high schools and look at the career pathways that we do have, um, and then making sure that our students know about the opportunity for apprenticeship and internship within the organizations that you know. But then again, having conversations with us about if we don't have that pathway that you're looking for, then how do we create that pathway in the future? For the, for, the, for your colleagues. So the key is coming and visit to see what we do have to offer and then also having a conversation about how is it that we can offer that pathway for your um, colleagues and to make sure that our students are ready for that. Do you have anything to say about Dr. That? Pereira, do you want to answer too? Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo everything. Sorry, it's recorded. Yes, yes, yes. I would echo uh, everything my colleague, uh, Dr. Diaz, uh, mentioned about the manufacturing. We also have an, a segment of that at Barlow High School. Um, and our students, it, it is a very popular class. Um, so we're, they're receiving the skills. And truly, uh, to be honest with you, it's what we're supposed to be doing as educators in schools is preparing our students for our communities. Again, as earlier I talked about the standards uh, we have as a nation focused on uh, a um, admissions officer's checklist as opposed to preparing our kids was truly needed in the community. So shame on us if we are not preparing kids for that. Another question, Jennifer? 
I don't have a question. I would just like to say thank you to uh, Gresham and Reynolds School District. You have the opportunity to use many vendors in your facilities. Um, and from our standpoint, you guys use us and a local vendor. It really gives us the opportunity to help in our schools to help with education and then also to give back to the students and fundraisers and things like that. So we appreciate you using local vendors for the districts. So thank you. Thank you for those comments. It's, it's truly a priority as well for us uh, with our bond work we're doing. And Mike, uh, we are over, I know we're over 50%, but what's that number? Uh, 58-ish. 58-ish uh, lo local individuals that are, uh, our companies that are working with us on the bond work. So again, that's dollars that's regenerated right here in Gresham. Um, it's an investment in our community as well as our schools and our students. So one of my jobs is I go and I suck the gas out of all the cars of all the construction workers at the end of the day so they've got to fill up before they leave. So that's my way of dealing with the shop local thing. Marty? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. As a graduate of Gresham High, I love seeing and supervising every time I drive by. <laughs> um, both of you have mentioned equity mm -hmm. uh, and how important it is in our districts. Could you uh, share with us a little bit about that, the lens in it within equity regarding our students who uh, don't identify as a particular gender that we're used to, the traditional gender roles? Mm -hmm. Um, as a share, we were very deliberate in our mission and vision in talking about each student as to no matter their address, their, their family's income, their socioeconomic background, if you will, the demographics of our students, uh, we're ensuring that we're preparing each and every student. And you could see that reflected in the curriculum um, that we are, per we are purchasing, redesigning. You will see that in the offerings that we have for our students. Uh, we need to, I mean, again, have access and opportunities for every single student in our, in our school district. Again, we cannot do that checklist anymore. We can no longer afford to do that, uh, not necessarily just as a school district, but as a country. We can no longer do that because we do have students who do not want to go and do not want to go on to college, but we also so I think could use an opportunity to redefine really what is college. Because if you look that word up, it's talking about preparing you for a career. And I don't know about you, but the manufacturing cl class and the woodworks and all the other classes, those are all preparing students for their future. Um, and so we have it reflected in our curriculum. We have it reflected in our, um, in our course offerings. And we're expanding those on a regular basis. Uh, again, providing access and opportunities for, for all of our students, no matter your um, instructional level, your uh, economic background, or your address or where you've come from, or where you were born or what language you speak. Um, and so we're offering those. Um, and we're beginning that language piece actually in this fall at Highland Elementary. We'll start in a kindergarten class, which is going to be a bilingual class of Spanish and English kindergartners. Can't wait till high school. Got to get that language before when that neuroplasticity is flexible in the brain. Another question. Here you go. I wanted to address her question about. Um, Oh, I'm one of sorry. The things, that's okay. One of the things that we also do that, that's required by the state is to make sure that the registration forms for students actually do not have a specific gender. Mm -hmm. um, so that's new. Um, so we had to review all of our registration packets to make sure that um, students can actually identify with who they believe they are. So that's one thing we do. Another thing is that we have in our high school, we have GSA, GSA clubs, um, and we're starting one. I believe RLA also has one, and we have teachers that advocate for our young people that um, have a different sexual orientation. And one of the things that uh, also happened, uh, I believe last week when I did a walkthrough at um, one of the schools, it was a day of silence um, for students that um, identify with LGBT. LGBTQ AI, um, and so it was a day of silence where the teacher wouldn't speak, the students wouldn't speak, but there was there was engagement in the classroom. So I just wanted to answer your question about that equity part. Thank you. Another question. Okay, so I've worked in with small businesses my entire career, either as a controller, CFO, work public accounting, all that kind of stuff. Done a lot of interviewing and hiring. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that just that I feel like our educational system, both in the, the high school and the graduate, the college is students need to know how to do a resume. They need to know how to fill out an application. They need to know how to interview. And this is something that I've not seen taught except at one university, which my youngest son graduated from. Uh, they had a class where they taught them resume writing. They did mock interviews. 
all of these kinds of things. I have sat in interviews with, with, with applicants and said, this is what you need to do to your resume because you almost didn't get this interview because your resume's weak. Um, this is something I feel like if we're preparing our students for the future and for getting jobs and being in the workplace, they need to know how to do that. And it is something I think they should be trained on. Is that something you guys have talked about or are addressing? So I'm proud to tell you that at Reynolds High School, uh, we have an AVID program that actually prepares our students to get their resume ready and have actually have mark, mock interviews with community members. So we invite you to be part of the mock interview process for then you can see our students actually presenting their resume and interviewing our students. And then there's actually a, a feedback form that we provide for our students to let them know how did they do. So if I can get your card, Absolutely. I'll make sure that I connect you with our principal to make sure you're a part of that because they do a phenomenal job and our students are fabulous thank you and I, I would echo the same um, all three of our high schools have that and have had it for a number of years so that's not a new opportunity for our students here in Gresham Barlow um, and I'm sure there's some uh, community members here that have participated in those over the years so if you have raise your hand if you've participated in those mock interviews uh, we have them at San Barlow Gresham High School and Springwater Trail and they're always looking for community members to come in and help with those um, and so we do have that they're working on and it's underclassmen we don't wait until they're seniors um, and so we begin that process very early now I'm not going to say that they don't always apply all those things outside of that <laughs> class but they do have opportunities great to do so Another question? Stuart, do you have a question? No. Monica does. Monica? You, huh? Oh, well, I wasn't sure what my question was. Um, let's see. <laughs> you always have a question. I always have a question. Uh, let's see. So uh, how are some of the other ways that you're getting the information out about what you're doing in the school district? You both have good websites that we can go to. and. Uh, Yes, um, our district is uh, very active on social media. So my first year last year was really kind of me. Then it has expanded to our um, principals. Um, next year we will include our teachers as well. And we've been pretty strategic about that. Uh, where's Athena? She's put together some uh, plans and she gives tips on how to put that information out and about into the community. Uh, but I also feel the more mediums we have, the less people know. Um, but we certainly maximize your service as well, um, your, your, your channels. Uh, we utilize the newspapers as well to try to get information out and about. Um, and of course in forums just like this. Uh, myself, my entire cabinet, we all belong to one organization or another in the community so we can share. Like I'm with Rotary, Rotary Lisa's with Kiwanis, Mike is obviously with Chamber, um, and James who's not here is with Lions. And again, on a regular basis we're trying to get that information out to the community. Because what we realize is that about 70% of the community has no direct connection with our schools, but they do have some values that are connected, and that's either their personal values or their property values, um, and it's related to what we do on a daily basis. So, you want to add? I, I did all everything she said, and then um, we're about, we're moving the furniture on our website right now, so we're moving it to the back, and then uh, we'll be launching a new website for the next school year. So right now we're just moving the furniture around and launching our new website. Uh, we also communicate. Um, we're getting better at communicating about our board meetings, making sure that our stakeholders understand when the board meeting is coming, what is it that happened at the board meeting, so we inform them before the board meeting, after the board meeting. So we're trying to be very intentional in our communication. We use our Facebook and we use our Twitter accounts to continue to do our work. Um, but there's always improvement in communication. Um, and so we're always looking at ways. So if you have any ideas, just share it with me, Stephanie and Beth, and we'll be more than happy to take them on how we can better serve our community, community by communicating better. And the last question is coming from Councillor Eccles. Thank you both for being here. Um, you talked, you talked about parents and before school and after school care. I just, as a, as a grandmother and watching my daughter and son-in-law and their lives and how busy they are, they don't really have an opportunity to get engaged with the schools that much. And it seems like that's probably pretty universal. And I was just wondering if you have had conversations or are you talking about alternative ways for families to get involved to support the schools? Um, when my daughter was in uh, Sweetbriar, um, 
I failed at recess duty. I was very bad at that. So I would go in after, after the class left and clean desks, and I would grade papers at home because I'm not good at recess duty. So just wondering what kind of conversations you're having about expanding the way that people can get involved. Um, I'm going to start with a, a, a different program that we have actually at East Gresham. I mean, not East Gresham, East Orient. We've got to get these, you know, got to get my orientation here at, uh, proper. Um, at East Orient, actually, they're piloting a program for us this year to try to get dads and grandfathers more involved as well in, in our schools. And so an alternative way we're doing that is that they've created a group called Eagle Eyes. And truly what happens is um, on a, I guess they have a schedule, I'm not sure if it's weekly or monthly or how they do that. But what occurs is that those, those individuals who volunteered for, for that committee and participation, they were trained by our safety coordinator um, <clears throat> about how to look out for things as suspicious, et cetera. They secured a perimeter of the school. How great is that? Um, and it's a simple thing. And here's what he's given them. A hat and a vest and a little motor roller walkie-talkie. And those guys who are doing those things, they feel like they're about 10 feet tall walking around that building making sure it's secure. Um, and that, I know, gives the, the administration as well as the staff at ease of mind. So this is one example. There are various others, but we're, we're piloting that at our school. Um, because again, I don't believe that we should have SROs all over our schools. Um, I think we can do that ourselves as a community because it is school. And I know what happened on Friday, however, um, we, we want our kids to be safe as well. And so we'll maximize all of our efforts on that. And I don't know if you have something, to, Dana, to add to that. Yes, yeah, so I, I understand how, uh, how you feel as a grandma. I'm a grandma too, and um, I have a 12-year-old grandson, and um, he doesn't live in Oregon, he lives in Texas. Um, but when I was raising my daughter, I was a single mom, and I used to work two jobs. And um, for me, parent engagement was very difficult because I used to have to leave, and I was a teacher, so I used to have to leave early in the morning to commute in Houston one hour from one place to another because I lived in League City and taught in Houston, Texas. And uh, what parent involvement really is, is did my mother, ha did my mother, did my daughter have breakfast in the morning before she went to school? And did she get her homework done um, the night before to make sure that she was a prepared for class? And sometimes involvement is defined just be, by you attending the school doesn't really necessarily mean involvement. What is it that you're doing at home to help your child be successful? And I think that's very important of what we interpret involvement and engagement. And so the academic parent-teacher teams actually is going to give our families the opportunity to have some activities to take home to help their children at home with the academics at home. And it doesn't have to be that the parents are coming to us. How is it that we can provide them with the activities and show them about the activities so that they can do it at home? And then we can meet with them, not every week, but maybe like quarterly or maybe twice a year, because we are busy working. Um, and then also identifying maybe we can have virtual meetings with families they don't have to come to us but how do we meet with them virtually so let's think differently about what parent involvement is especially with our families that are working two or three jobs um, and that could be a way so with my grandson who's 12 years old how do I engage in his work to make sure he's getting his work done and he's getting the grades that he needs he just visited me three weeks ago and he comes with his Chromebook and he's actually communi communicating virtually with his classmates and he's actually turning in his assignments virtually to his teachers from here to Texas. Not only that, but his mother is asking him what project is due before you get back. And then I'm asking him what grades does he, is he making because I pay him $5 for every A he makes. <laughs> So that's how we get engaged, right? And then he always lets me know every time I talk to him, I'm doing okay, I have two Bs, I have you know, eight As, and I'm like, that's really good. And then how much do I owe you? Oh, about $62, okay. <laughs> But that's how we do it. We have to think differently about what involvement is, especially now in the 21st century, because we don't have the kind of jobs we used to have way back, way back. And I just want to say thank you as a grandmother. Warner mentioned when he, before he introduced everybody that the chamber directory that's coming out highlighted all three of our superintendents, the Reynolds superintendent, Centennial superintendent, and Gresham Barlow superintendent. 
Um, and the title of that is Huge Impact Despite Speed Bumps. One of them had the greatest gift given to her, but it came very early in life. Another had a severely torn ACL, is that right? ACL, AC something letters in the knee that changed that person's life. And another one um, worked for Nike, but management passed him over. <clears throat> Even though he had all the experience and been managing the whole area for years, passed him over because of lack of a degree. And those instances, there's more to it, but please get your directory and read about the personal lives of the people that are touching our children's lives. I want to thank uh, our sponsors again, Portland General Electric, Columbia Bank, Gresham Barlow School District, and Metro East Community Media. Could you please give them a round of applause? This was not possible without them. Next month is Port of Portland for the BLT, the Business and Leaders Luncheon. Uh, the following month, we'll probably do an uh, um, election wrap-up, excuse me, the legislative wrap-up that's provided they're done. Um, and then I want to give you just a little teaser. October 17th is our business summit. And our business summit is with Pete Blank. He's a Disney University person. It's going to be three and a half hours of laughter, learning, and leaders. And Reynolds had the transformational model up there. It said, listen, learn, and lead. That morning, you're going to do laughter, learn, and lead. So I encourage you. We don't have the website up yet, so you can register, but that's a little teaser at the end of the week. So are you, um, were you impressed with what you heard this morning? We've got some dynamite women leading our school district. So thank you very much. We'll see you next month.